Ya. Mas Alex. Selamat datang Mas Alex. Mana kabarnya Mas? Terima kasih. Selamat malam. Uh, kabarnya baik. Halo Mas Alex. Lama nggak jumpa. Halo. Eh, hey, Faisal, apa kabar? Baik, Mas. Aduh, Pak Irwandi ini, Mas Alek ini dulu satu waktu dan satu kampus dengan saya di Ohio. Selamat Wah. malam. Uh, kabarnya baik. <laughs> Halo, Mas Alek. Lama nggak jumpa. Aku kangen. Hey, Faisal, apa kabar? Kangen lihat baik, Mas. Mas. Alek. Aduh, Mas Alek ini dulu satu waktu dan satu kampus dengan saya di Ohio. Oh iya iya siap siap. Oh, ya, Aku <laughs> baik. Mas Alex. Kangen Mas Alex. Hey, Faisal apa? Uh, yes. Mas Alex. Oke. Okay. Hey Brian. <laughs> ya yeah, sudah banyak lama ya. Oh ya. Yeah. Yang uh, lalu di. Kapan? Dua ribu dua ribu dua ribu dua belas ya. Enam yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. tahun yang lalu. Ya <laughs> ya. Yeah, yeah. Saya bahagia Anda bisa datang hari ini. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, uh, siapa mau mulai uh, diskusi ini? Dita, silakan Bu. Oke, okay, ya, siap. Um, Oke, okay, good evening everyone in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Um, wait, let me open my camera. Um, Oke, okay, good evening everyone in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Good morning for those in the United States and good afternoon for those in the UK and some parts of Europe. Um, um, evening everyone in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. moderator today. And actually, this is the first time for me to use three greetings at the same time. Yeah, three time zones. And this is very interesting. As interesting is the topics that uh, our keynote speakers over for tonight uh, in Indonesia. Okay, um, our webinar for tonight is Finding Photographic Practice in Southeast Asia. And Brian Arnold and Charles Fox, they will be our uh, honorable keynote speakers for today. And we will also have Bapak Pamukas Wahyu Setianto as um, the commentator, or as um, later he will be discussing and joining with uh, Brian and Charles. Uh, by the way, welcome Brian and Charles, and also a uh, welcome to all participants. Um, well, literally from almost all over the world. Uh, we have from Southeast Asia, UK, USA, uh, and then uh, of course, Indonesia, some of our students and Selamat Malam, para dosen, uh, Fakultas Seni Media Rekamis Yogyakarta. Uh, terima kasih Pak Faisal Adib, uh, because uh, IPIS or the American Institute for Indonesian Studies has organized this webinar tonight. This is very exciting for all of us. And um, Bapak Adib atau Bapak Faisal Adib ini adalah program manager for the Yogyakarta branch. Begitu ya Pak ya. Selamat malam Pak Faisal. Uh, well, this webinar is in collaboration from IPIS. Uh, with the photography department of the Faculty of Recorded Media Arts is Yogyakarta. And um, today our keynote speakers, they will be sharing and discussing about their experiences in photography practice in Southeast Asia. And as you know that Southeast Asia has been a very interesting place, a very exotic destination for all those Westerners or Western researchers. Uh, well, but with their efforts, now we can gain new insights, new perspectives, and we can learn our culture and its value in different perspectives. But before we start, uh, we have something to see first. Okay, I will, uh, Mas Aji dan Mas Novan, can you start the screen sharing? Okay. I'll wait. Mas Aji, Mas Novan? Yes.
okay? Thank you so much. And I would like to say hi to some of our um, distinguished uh, participants. We have known them for a quite long time. We have Bapak Alexander Supartono, Mas Alex from Edinburgh Napier University. And we also have um, some other participants which are from distinguished uh, universities such as Leiden University. And then we also have Mas Sandi Wijaya from Macaraka. And then uh, who else, Pak Irwandi? Do you have the list of the participants that you want to say hi? Okay, and also by by Rwandi. Okay, um, okay. So many uh, participants tonight, and I some of them are researchers, some photographers. And before we really start the web webinar tonight, I would like to invite Bapak Irwandi, Dr. Irwandi, as the dean of the Faculty of Recorded Media Arts in Yogyakarta, to give his remarks. Bapak Irwandi, you may deliver your remarks now. Okay. Silakan, Pak Irwandi. Terima kasih, Ibu Tita. Uh, dengan bahasa Indonesia atau Inggris? Maybe in English, I think. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hello all and good evening, Indonesia time. We are very honored for being the host of, for IFIS webinar, Finding Photographic Practice in Southeast Asia, in conjunction with the Photography Department, Faculty of Record Media Arts, is Yogyakarta. Uh, as the Dean of Faculty of Recorded Media Arts, I'd like to express my scenery gratitude for IFIS that was introduced by Mr. Faisal Adib, the Program Manager of IFIS for Yogyakarta Branch. And my gratitude especially goes to our distinguished keynote speaker, Brian Arnold, Charles Fox, and Mr. Pamungkas Wahyu Setianto, and also to all participants. Thank you for joining this online class, general lecture with, I think it's a resemblance with international seminar because uh, attend from many, many uh, academic and uh, person from other country. Therefore, I hope this collaboration project could be another stepping stone for the future collaboration between IFIS and Faculty of Record Media Arts, EC Yogyakarta. My colleagues from all department here, photography, film and television, and animation, will be delighted to further this great opportunity for an international collaboration for the better future of the research in arts, media, culture, and community, as well as the discourse and take with them. Last but not least, last, I hope everyone could enjoy this webinar and gain more insight. Once again, thanks for IFIS, Brian Arnold, Charles Fox, for your kind enthusiasm for bringing up this webinar. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, terima kasih, Pak Irwandi, untuk sambutannya. Uh, sekali lagi sebelum kita mulai, mohon bagi yang namanya belum sesuai dengan pendaftarannya, harap disesuaikan dulu. Lalu rule untuk webinar malam ini adalah ketika Anda punya pertanyaan atau komen, silakan tuliskan di kolom chat nanti. Jadi uh, kita akan membacakan pertanyaan Anda ketika presentasi sudah selesai. Mohon di mute dulu semua mikrofonnya, Mas Aji atau Mas Novan, tolong. Karena kita akan segera mulai dengan Brian dan Charles. Okay, so uh, once again, good evening, everyone. And so uh, I would like to introduce our two keynote speakers. The first one is Brian Arnold. He is a fine art photographer in Ithaca, New York, and he has been working with the Southeast Asia program at uh, Cornell. And then he, uh, in 1992, he went to Indonesia for the first time, and he went to a school in Bali in Peliatan. And since 2011, Brian has been researching the history of photography in Indonesia, and he has already finished one book on the subject of identity crisis. I think you have seen this book all over the Google, and maybe you already own the book. Uh, it's a very interesting book. And later this year, hopefully, uh, he will release another book, which is A History of Photography in Indonesia. And Brian, we will be waiting for your book. And then our second keynote speaker is Charles Fox. 
He is a photographer in England from uh, Nottingham University. He teaches there. And formerly, he has worked with the UNICEF and the United Nations. He is also the founder of Catfish Books, uh, on, uh, sorry, an English publisher focusing in for the books about South Southeast Asia. Um, probably some of you already uh, know about the Catfish Books. Uh, it uh, publishes interesting books about photography and some narrations, some text there. You can go check the Catfish Books. And then uh, with his photography, Charles Fox works in Cambodia. And tonight he will be sharing his experience in Cambodia. And then uh, we also have Bapak Pamungkas Wayu Setianto. He is a lecturer of photography department, and he will be joining uh, Brian and Arnold. Uh, sorry, Brian and Charles to discuss about their presentation uh, today. And um, once again, they will be presenting and sharing their experience. So later, you can ask about their experience and sort of things. And um, for Charles, he will be focusing in his works in Cambodia. And then uh, please stay tuned for this webinar until it's over because you will regret if you leave this webinar before it's <laughs> over. It's, it will be way too magnificent. And then, uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big applause for our two keynote speakers and Bapak Pamukas. And we will start with um, Brian. Brian, are you ready to start? Yes. Okay, selamat malam. Silahkan, Brian. Yeah. Uh, sebelum uh, saya mulai, saya mau berterima kasih juga. Uh, saya mau berterima kasih kepada EFIS dan Pak Faisal, uh, ISI Jogjakarta, um, Pak Irwandi, uh, Ibu Adia, dan Las Pamangkus. Uh, saya bahagia kita bisa, um, bisa share idea uh, hari ini. Uh, ini sudah empat mungkin lima kali uh, saya berkata dengan isi Jogja dan saya, saya bahagia saya, saya bisa lagi uh, yang lalu saya mengajar um, workshop di sana dan saya kuliah beberapa kali di isi Jogja um, ok today um, tonight or this morning um, I would like to talk about uh, the work that I've been pursuing in Indonesia since 2011 as Ibu Adia already mentioned, I first went to Indonesia in 1992 um, on a study abroad program uh, through my university. I went to school in Bali and I studied Balinese religion and Balinese arts, Balinese music uh, in particular. And since 1992, I have traveled to Indonesia every opportunity that I've been able to. Uh, I often need grants, it's a very expensive trip for me. Um, and it's been a major part of my life for a long time. Uh, for Since 1993, I have worked with many different organizations in the United States and Australia uh, to advance the study of Indonesian art and Indonesian culture around the world. Uh, and most recently, I have been working with um, the Southeast Asia program at Cornell University. Uh, before I talk about my own work, uh, I want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about another artist and ethnographer. He's been a big influence on me. Uh, his name is Harry Smith, a very strange man who worked in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s. He was an anthropologist. Um, he was a shaman and he was an, an experimental filmmaker. And much of what I admire about uh, Harry Smith's work is the way that he entered into his study of culture and anthropology and art all as one practice. And he was constantly looking for ways that he could bring um, his study of American and other cultures um, into his practice as an artist. Uh, he's most well known for his work as an experimental filmmaker, as well as his kind of unique approaches to anthropology and as an ethnographer or anthropologist, he collected a lot of different materials uh, to record things about American culture in specific. Um, he's very famous for a collection of paper airplanes. He's very famous for a collection of um, string figures, which you can see in this slide. 
He would walk around the streets of New York City and collect paper airplanes that people left. And one of my favorite uh, works that he's done, perhaps what he's most famous for, is an eight record set he made in the early 1960s. That was an anthology of American folk music from the 1920s and 1930s. And uh, part of what has interested me about him for so long um, is the way that he used his study of culture and collecting pieces, material pieces of, of his culture as a starting point for his own creative practice. And I think I've tried to assume um, a similar approach to my work in Indonesia. Uh, since 1992, um, I have been working as a professional photographer and performing and studying gamelan music. Uh, you can see me here playing bonang right at the front of this gamelan orchestra at Cornell University. Uh, very strangely, for a long time, uh, I worked as a photographer and I was a student of Indonesian music and art. And it took me a very long time to think of studying Indonesian photography, which I started in 2011. Um, another really important part of my own photographic practice is, is photographic technology. Uh, after living in Indonesia in 1992 and finishing my college degree, um, I ended up doing a graduate degree, a master's of fine arts in photography at the Massachusetts College of Art where I finished in 1998. Uh, in 1998 at that time, uh, digital technology was rapidly developing though photography was still primarily a film medium. I remember in the early 2000s, maybe around 2003, 2004, um, a shocking few days when two or three major photographic um, film and paper producers discontinued a lot of their products and made a commitment to going digital. And at that time, I decided to re reinvent my photographic process and not necessarily move to a digital practice, but to think of photography as something that happens in a variety of different forms that's analog and digital and and any number of things that we can think of. It's Instagram, it's museums, it's newspapers, it's galleries. And at that time, I tried to create a photographic process for myself that would work, um, that would require me working um, in the field in a variety of different ways. So I have worked as a writer, a historian, a curator, a photographer, a newspaper photographer, a fine art photographer, Instagram, film, like all of these things are part of my daily practice as a photographer. And Indonesia has provided an important way for me to pursue a practice with that, that approach. In 2011, I started working with the Southeast Asia program at Cornell. In 2014, I received a grant from the American Institute for Indonesian Studies and went to Java for six months and taught photography at UC Jogja, at UTB in Bandung, UNPAS in Bandung, um, UEE in Jogja, UIN in Jogja, um, and the Universitas Indonesia in Jakarta. And all of this was a really amazing experience. And I met a lot of photographers and a lot of teachers of photography around Java. And when I came back in 2014, um, I was offered a three-year faculty position at Cornell, and I was contracted by the Johnson Museum of Art at the Cornell, on the Cornell campus to put together an exhibition of um, fine art photography from Java uh, called Identity Crisis, Reflections on Public and Private Life in Contemporary Javanese Photography. Um, while I was putting the, the book and the exhibition together, I took advantage of the research materials available at the Cornell Library. Um, Cornell has one of the largest Indonesian language holdings in the world, um, perhaps the largest Indonesian language holding in the world, and has a number of important research archives, including materials by Claire Holt, uh, Neil Staus Decker, uh, George Cahan, uh, Benedict Anderson, things like that, people like that. 
which was an incredible opportunity um, of specific interest to me was Claire Holt, um, who as most of you probably know, um, was a very important uh, English language uh, historian of Indonesian art. Her book, Art in Indonesia, Continuities and Change, published in 1967, is still considered the most important en English language textbook about Indonesian art. Uh, she was also one of the founders of the Cornell Modern Indonesian Project and the Southeast Asia program at Cornell. Um, I love her photographs, actually. So she's most well known for her writing, but her research photographs of Javanese dance, as well as dance from Sulawesi, Sumatra, and Bali all, are all really amazing. And she would often cut them up and make these little collages to help with her research. This particular page um, is all hand gestures documenting particular movements found in Javanese dance. Uh, the exhibition I put together at the Johnson Museum opened in 2017. To the best of my knowledge, it was the first exhibition in the United States devoted to work by Indonesian photographers. Uh, there were 10 different artists in the exhibition, uh, four of them from Yogyakarta, all photographers associated with MES 56. Uh, in this particular image uh, from the, the museum, you can see it work by Wimo Bayang. Wimo Mbala Bayang, a photographer I love, a really great person, a good friend of mine, uh, Jim Allen Abel, and Dito Yuwono. Uh, there were other photographers from the faculty at ETB um, and different photographers from Jakarta and East Java as well. Uh, in conjunction with this exhibition, I published the book Identity Crisis. Um, there were three sections to the book, if you haven't seen it. Uh, the first section is an essay that I wrote about my research in Indonesia, um, my study of Claire Holt and Niels Dows Decker uh, while working at Cornell. Uh, the second part of the book is, uh, is portfolios that feature the 10 different photographers included in the exhibition. And there's an afterword uh, written by a Javanese curator and art historian, Aminuddin Siragar, who runs the gallery at ETB and is a prominent writer on contemporary and modernist art in Java. Uh, his essay is, I found very interesting and he documents um, the first known Indonesian language texts about fine art photography in Java, which were published I think in the 1940s or 1950s. Uh, here are some of the portfolio pages. Uh, a photographer I admire a great deal in Bandung, Henry Chusnapit Sunardo. Uh, I am currently finishing another book, which I hope to have out later this year. Uh, the, the title of the book is A History of Photography in Indonesia, Essays on photo Photography from the Colonial Era to the Digital Age. There are 17 essays um, in the book. I wrote five of them and translated two of them. You can see some of the different um, essays that I wrote here, as well as some of the other contributors. Some of them you know from the faculty at EC Jogja, Supraptu Sujono, um, Wimo Bayong from Jogjakarta, Oscar Motolo, Karen Strassler. Um, so the book is an attempt to piece together uh, different approaches to looking at photography in Indonesia uh, from different eras of the history of the medium. Uh, and collectively, I hope that they give us a good glimpse at how photography has developed in Indonesia. Uh, I think it's very important in the greater history of photography to look at the, the colonized nations. Uh, photography played an important role uh, in the European colonial enterprise. And I think how that influenced the development of the medium and the, the colonized cultures of the world is essential. And I think uh, the voices in photography that are emerging uh, from many of those nations, Indonesia across Southeast Asia, are offering us totally new ways of thinking about the medium. Um, and I hope this book will serve as an opportunity to develop uh, more conversations on subjects like that. Uh, the funny thing is the way that I started making these books, like Identity Crisis, and this new book, A History of Photography in Indonesia. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've tried to develop a photographic practice that includes writing and working as a photographer myself, but I've also found it's much easier to get grants <laughs> for writing projects than it is for photographic projects. Um, so part of how, I, how and why I put this together is, is because I wanted to go to Indonesia to make photographs. And I found that I really liked writing about photography in Indonesia. I really love meeting photographers in Java where I do most of my work. Um, and it's been a really great opportunity to share the things that I've learned both as an image maker and meeting other photographers, curators and historians in Indonesia. I decided to include uh, some of the photographs I used to illustrate um, the essays that I wrote for the book. Um, this is Adolf Schaefer, a daguerreotypist, not the first daguerreotypist to work in Java, but the first one to work successfully. That's a daguerreotype of a Balinese barong mask. Um, one of my favorite photographers uh, that I write about is a Dutch photographer named Cas Orthus, who was a very progressive leftist photographer in the Netherlands. He went to Indonesia in the late 1940s and uh, put together a book called Unstaten Verding, which means a state in the making. Uh, Cas Orthus became a strong advocate and proponent for um, ending the colonial occupation of Indonesia and promote, promoting for a, a free nation. Um, this is his photograph of the signing of the Lincoln Jati Agreement in, I can't remember the year, 1947, something like that. Um, uh, Ifos, uh, when I was in Java in 2014, uh, Yudi Sergio uh, Moja just released his book, Ethos Remastered, and I had the chance to talk with him about putting this book together. It's a fantastic book. I love this photograph of Sukarno with the Catholic bishops. Uh, this is another photograph by Henry Chusnapit Napit Sunago. Um, one, of the uh, one of the essays I wrote in the book is on um, contemporary photography in Bandung. Uh, another book I'm hoping to have out this year, I'm still raising money to get it published, is called Javan, Indonesian Landscapes. And it's all photographs I've made in um, Bali, Lombok, and Java between 2011 and 2016. Uh, it includes uh, an essay by Aminuddin Siragar, the curator at ETB, as an afterword, and just a few photographs from the book. This is the cover photograph made in Bantul in 2014 uh, from a warong in Jogja, just outside Mess 56 in 2016. Um, earlier this year, um, I finished a small zine of photographs. Uh, the book is maybe, it's a zine or a book, maybe 30 pages. I made it myself. There are only 20 copies of it right now. Uh, the name of the book is called, or the name of the book is From Out of Darkness. And it is a mix of images and text that I have gathered between 2011 and, or actually between 1992 and 2018. And it's a meditation on how and why I went to in Indonesia for the first time and what has attracted me about working there all of these years. Uh, so I just included a few pages of this book. Um, I made, as I said, 10 or 20 of them on my own and um, have already sold a couple to museums in the United States, actually. And I'm hoping to get this book published on a broader scale. But here are a few pages from the book. And the text comes in really short pieces. And I thought I would share a few links um, to my website. I'm happy to take emails from anybody if you don't get a chance to ask a question today. Um, I first met Charles Fox a couple of months ago. Uh, his assistant found me on Facebook and I published an interview with Catfish Books. Uh, Charles and I are in the early stages of putting some projects together to do some more documentation and advocacy for photographers working in Southeast Asia. 
So I would encourage you to look at Catfish Books website, catfish.asia, as well as the uh, web link to the book I did with After Hours in Jakarta um, Identity Crisis. And that is all I have today. And I think I don't know how to turn screen sharing off. How do I do that? Stop share. And uh, I'm really delighted to have Charles uh, join us today. Um, I've been working with Charles for the last two months, obviously because I'm in New York and he is in England. All of it has been happening on online. And I, did I stop the sharing? Yes. Okay. And I will let Charles take it over from here. Thank you, Brian. That was fascinating. Really good to see your work in, in context like that as well. Um, and talking about some of the projects we we're we're striving forward with, which is which is really great. Um, you'll have to excuse my pronunciation, but I believe uh, ter Terama Kase is uh, what I say for thank you, and I'd like to say thank you for everyone who's organised this today. It's it's a real privilege and an honour to to talk to such a large group of people. Um, well, the 73 that are here, so thank you for, for taking the time to listen to us today. Um, I think it's a really interesting question, finding practice in Southeast Asia. It's never really been posed um, to me like this, but it's something I consider all the time because I, I really do owe a lot to Southeast Asia for this finding of practice, but also more specifically to uh, Cambodia, where I've been working since um, 2005. And I'd like to take the opportunity to share some work. This is quite a lengthy slideshow, so I will skip over parts of it, um, but it should give you some context of, uh, of how I've been working. So let me just share the screen with you. Is that showing? Does it just say Charles Fox at the bottom? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So my work, when I first arrived in Cambodia, my, my, my initial practice was very much based in photojournalism. So I was freelancing for newspapers um, and the main one was the Cambodia Daily. Um, and at the time when I arrived in Cambodia, I was I had a, some context to the country um, and I was plunged into this role where I think I was photographing things which were, you know, probably beyond my years. I mean, photographs from the Khmer Rouge tribunals, um, images from brick factories, you know, land reclamation, um, conversations with the UN and, and what's, what was really starting to happen was this, this development of a practice, this sense of understanding this context in which I was working. And, and really through photography, I was able to extend the sort of questioning. And I think what, what's become interesting over the years is I do wrestle with what has become more significant to me. Is it the medium itself or, or is it the question that I've sort of formed um, through working in Cambodia, but also working with photography. And most of this work that I've just sh shared with you was um, single images for um, the newspapers. So my, my work in many ways, I suppose in a photojournalistic sense was meant to sum up or, you know, sort of give us a sense of what was happening. Um, but I was always very conscious that my work was then framed within two to 300 words. I was essentially illustrating, um, illustrating other people's um, responses and writing. And the more I worked in single image, the more frustrated I became by that process because my question was growing, my understanding was growing, and I started to move away from this, this conversation of just a single image. What's been really interesting from that is actually that text has played quite a significant role 
in the development of my practice. I mean, here when we have the single image to projects that I'll share with you down the road and, and conversations that I've been having with photography. So from the single image, I moved into longer term documentary work. This is a series of photographs about a group of divers in Cambodia who cleared the rivers of explosives left over from the conflict, from the Khmer Rouge and the Civil War. And what I started to notice was I was always dealing with the unseen. Um, I mean, although in this image we see the diver in the water with the bomb, you know, I, I was often having conversations about things that were unseen, you know, um, buried objects such as bombs and sunken objects such as boats with bombs. And what I found was that I could photograph moments and events, but I struggled to deal with the historic aspects of the work. So what occurred over a four year process was a very intimate um, bond with a group of a group of remarkable men in Cambodia who, uh, who are my friends to this day. And I suppose for some in photojournalism, that can be a, a complicated thing. There's often a distance, which I've never really, never really bought into. I'm, I, I'm very close with the people I photograph. I, I, it's not, I don't see them as subjects. They're, they're quite active in the process. Um, and, and I spent a lot of time, I think this is why it took four years because of, I actually really enjoyed working with them. Um, so the project progressed and there was moments of clearing explosives out of rivers with fishermen, such as we see here, um, training with American military for clearing bombs. And, and actually what I found was that the role of the photographer quickly disappeared and I, I had a function within this sort of group. They were very conscious of what I did, but that I knew when to put the camera down. And actually there's a, a lot of scenes that were never photographed because there was another function I had to play. I had to be a part of this team. And this body of work really sort of started to stretch my questioning of, of what I was dealing with. Um, I mean, a, a colleague of mine at Nottingham Trent, a research professor called uh, Duncan Higgins, we we sort of and i'm just looking off to the wall because it's written on my wall there's sort of questioning of trying to articulate what is unknown and what is at the edge of our comprehension and this has proved to be an important point of reflection um and i, I thought it was really interesting in in the introduction there was the discussion of perspective and and i really do believe that you know it's bringing a perspective to these sort of extended questions so bomb divers in many ways achieved um, a lot of things. It, it raised, you know, it sort of cleared the sort of appetite I had to extend these questions. But I, I found a problem at the time that when it came to showing this work, and it, it showed widely, it was exhibited in part of Bangkok Photo Festival. It was shown at the... SOAS Gallery in London, in Paris and New York as part of joint exhibitions. And in, in publications, you know, significant, you know, Sunday Times, National Geographic, Time Magazine. But actually the framing of it sort of always dropped into bombs and explosives and conflict and danger. And it became quite something that was you know, um, it became quite macho and I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm so far removed from this sort of macho view of the world. Um, and that's okay. I mean, I, I can see with the subjects I photographed, but this work was never just about bombs and explosives. It was actually about Cambodian resilience, this ability to adjust and move towards um, solutions post-conflict. And what it also started to make me question was my role as a photojournalist, the discussion of genre and where I sat within genre, the limitations of sometimes dealing in genre, but also 
again, this question of what I hadn't seen. So from what I hadn't seen, I became very interested in the images in family archives and prior to the Khmer Rouge and after the Khmer Rouge. And I set up this uh, online accessible archive called Found Cambodia. And Found Cambodia functions in many ways to a lot of online archives. Um, you know, there are images of the past for us to view. You can, you can search under specific terms. But one of the core philosophies of this body of work was that no work sat without some context. Every image is captioned by the family. And this sort of language became important because while, while these images sat on this space, the family attested a level of knowledge to it. So it happens in many functions. I, you know, I worked with, uh, for example, you know, family trees. Um, we returned every photograph as a new, every one, every photograph that I photographed, we then reprinted and gave to the families. Um, and this was sort of my rationale for how the work functioned. If you take the middle line, let's say this is a sort of timeline. So in, in Khmer, um, you know, there'd be certain periods here and that would be the historic timeline, you know? So here maybe, for example, this was uh, the UN intervention by like UNTAC um, and there was also the the refugee camps and we saw photographs which were removed from the historical and media dominated timeline we saw the daily life we saw people's views of the world now we have to take into account how complicated the family archive is but it gave a more nuanced representation of what was happening in Cambodia at the time um, and it showed me personally parts of the country which I had never seen or things that I hadn't actually explored. What became really interesting for me when I started to rationalize this within uh, Nottingham Trent University was the idea of how the image, um, the image life cycle worked. So at this red dot here, this would be my moment where I first encounter the photograph and then I would copy it, either make a photograph of it, uh, if it was a negative, I'd scan it um, and return it to the family. And that image life cycle, although interrupted, would continue. But this copy of an image would exist on the archive. So there's a sort of parallel existence. And I've always been really interested to see what happens if I ever encounter a picture later on, whether I see the pictures again. Um, so I became very interested in history, very interested in the life cycle of the image and, and how these then tied back into this question of what was at the edge of comprehension. And these are some of the images that we've encountered. You know, there was always um, images which were heavily damaged um, through watermarks or being stuck with tape, but this whole new level of materiality um, the repurposing of images um, from before the Khmer Rouge, which were then photoshopped to recreate family life. We see this with wedding photography as well. I would come across um, really a, a family tree in, in a, um, a cigar box. And with the families, we'd work and discuss the, the structure of the family. What what I found very haunting and difficult with this in Cambodia is often we'd be looking at a family portrait where people are, you know, like this photograph of a young boy here, that was the only photograph of a father in a family who'd passed away. So while we don't necessarily see the, re, the modern image of them all together, we could reconstruct these family pictures and it shows this, this deadening and flattening that photography does. I exhibited this work once um, in combination with some of my own practice 
at a research conference in um, Nottingham. And I decided from that that I probably wouldn't exhibit the work again. I, I didn't feel that it functioned in that way. It was for people to view on the archive and, and to engage with it. But what did happen was the idea that some work that I encountered was so complete, it deserved its own conversation. So in 2015, I received an email from the Rama family <clears throat> in LA. And this is the portrait of the Rama family from the refugee camp in Thailand. This was their photographic ID, uh, excuse me. And the Ramas had this remarkable set of images from before the Khmer Rouge and then also after. And what they did, which was quite a, um, a surreal thing at the time to me, but actually is commonplace. They actually buried the photographer, the photographs. They buried the photographs to protect their identity from the Khmer Rouge. And then when they dug them up, they continued to build on top of this archive. Um, and this happened a lot in Cambodia. Um, I've worked with other families who have done a similar thing, but I'd never heard of it prior to this. So what happened over this long period of time was we started thinking about how the work could exist. I'm sorry, this video is a bit shaky. And we eventually settled on a book form. So I made this mock-up of a book and I sent it to LA where they live. And I said, make any notes, any comments. And it came back with this text. And, and actually then these handwritten captions became really important. There was a level of sort of authorship of the family and you know, their intimate reaction to these historic family images, um, which sort of sat with what we thought about found Cambodia would do. And in the end, this is where Buried came to to life. Um, and again, you know, we talked about this idea of um, working with people and intimacy and actually my role here changed completely. You know, there was, it wasn't me, cons not me as a photographer, it was me, someone working with the knowledge I had of Cambodia with a family with a rare body of work and, and how we sort of communicated and collaborated. Um, and this is what Buried came to be. What was interesting about Buried is that it was, um, it was all written in English. And the essays, you know, including by Dr. Jennifer Good from LCC and uh, Fiona McLaren, who works at Nottingham Trent with me, um, who are English academics. It also included text by Cambodian writers uh, Darate Din, who did her MA in the UK, um, who's a fantastic writer and a very modern voice on her generation's experiences post-conflict. Uva Rack, who's a Cambodian-American who returned to Cambodia to set up um, all manner of um, charities and think tanks. And what I tried to do was ensure that there was a sense of voice, not only of the Western academic, but also the Cambodian artists and writers um, where this work sort of resided. Now the book was in English because the Ramas, you know, speak English. Vera, uh, the head of the family speaks very little Khmer now. Um, but there was questioning about whether this book would be in Khmer and, and that's something in the process. But I mean, and again, it did the things that, you know, some sometimes expect, but it exhibited and it was successful at book conferences, but um, taking the work back to Cambodia was one of the most important things for the Rama family. So we had an exhibition in Phnom Penh at Meta House, um, but getting to the stage where the book was actually published uh, was really problematic. And, and actually this is what happens with a lot of my work and I'm sure Brian is the same and, and other photographers in the room that, um, there are limitations, particularly when dealing with things which aren't necessarily um, of the moment or on trend. Um, and when I approached publishers about the work, I got really good responses. 
Um, but they asked me to do other things. One of them was asked to return to the village where the Rama family lived and shoot contextual images. Um, and that was unfair on the family. Um, you know, they didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do it. It moved away from the collaboration. Um, and other bits and pieces, you know, came up and we thought, no, it has to stay true to its intent. So from that, from looking around, I realized there was very little in the way of conversation about photo, photo books. I mean, I know um, the invisible photographer in Singapore do this very well. Um, and After Hours is publishing really great books. Um, but there wasn't anyone in, in the UK who had access to the photo books, uh, um, sales and the events in the UK to sort of push these sort of missing important narratives coming out of Southeast Asia. So in the, initially it was to publish work out of sort of my frustration, um, but also then to realize that there was broader conversations in Southeast Asia. Um, so it's, it's a very small organization. There's myself, I uh, have a, a researcher, Cal, who works with me, um, who's exceptional. Um, and Brian, as I said, has been collaborating with us, which is brilliant. But part of this was in conversation where we started to talk to photographers in Southeast Asia. And what's really good about in conversation is we try and keep this plan where the person we interview recommends the next person. So we had uh, Lily in, in Bangkok who recommended Matcha. Um, Matcha recommended Thuma, an incredible female, all female collective in Myanmar and on and on. And I, I like the way that I've always found this a really positive thing in Southeast Asia that borders in terms of photographic practice are quite porous, people talk, Angkor Photo Festival, for example, has been a very important part of that. So I wanted to replicate the sense of community and we are looking to work with other photographers. Um, but just to show you a more recent piece of work, which continues with this sort of, um, I suppose, methodology of how I work with people, I just wanted to shop, stop sharing this screen for one second and show you this video. Can you see that screen? If someone can let me know, that'd be great. Yes, can we yes, see yes, that? Yes, yes, Thank yes, you yes, so yes, much. Yes. Thank you. So this video was actually from the, um, uh, a production by um, the Father King uh, Sihanouk in Cambodia, um, who produced many films before the Khmer Rouge. And uh, this was one of them. Um, and it features, um, I'll just go back to the PowerPoint, features uh, the Prum, who is a lady I'm working with now in Cambodia. Um, from a family, from a series of images which she hid and during the Khmer Rouge. And this work starts to expand on questions that I've had about the Cambodian landscape. Um, there is always this drive for this um, picturesque view of the landscape when actually there is a lot of hidden trauma um, residing in the landscape and a lot of unknown and unseen. So over the last couple of years, we've been retracing her steps from during the Khmer Rouge, um, photographing the land, photographing sites of memorial. And sites of memorial are really interesting in Cambodia because there's the state sanctioned sites of memorial, but there's 
which are very important, like Tor Sleng and um, uh, the Killing Fields, um, which are vital points of reflection. But there's also the the community level of remembrance and the community sides of um, of memory. So we we trapped it, and, and there's a lot to be resolved in this work still. Um, but we're looking for relationships between the land and the family's portraits. But also something important has happened that um, the family started to engage in sight writing. So when we visited areas, they um, started to reflect on, on their experiences and their memories. And this has all been written in Khmer. Um, and there is much debate about how this work will move forward, whether this will be translated into English or whether this is a book which will just be situated um, in Khmer, in, in the language of the family that deal with it. So this is how language has been sort of important all the way through. So what it really brings me back to is, you know, this question that I had at the beginning of, you know, finding practice in Southeast Asia and what, what has become significant, you know, is it the medium, is it the question, what are the limitations of photography, but also what is my role as a, you know, as a foreign photographer, researcher, um, publisher, and, and what perspective do I give and how do I facilitate the conversations of others? Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. And thank you all very much for listening and your time. Uh, okay. Terima kasih, Mas Brian dan Mas Charles. Thank you so much, Brian and Charles, for sharing your experience and your project and your uh, travel to Indonesia and Cambodia. That was very interesting, especially that um, you are not just doing it for photography, but uh, you do it with all your heart that even when you present it now, you still have like, uh, what is it? You have the, what is it? The, the vibe feeling that you were really engaged in the community that you were once uh, there. And um, once again, thank you so much for the new insights and the, uh, what is it, the, the great uh, experience that you have uh, told us. And for the next session, Bapak Pamungkas Wai Sutianto will be joining uh, with us and to discuss further about your presentation. Pak Pamungkas, monggo, mengulai atau bagaimana? Atau mungkin uh, saya sampaikan dulu sebentar uh, huh? bahwa tadi uh, ya, Mas Brian sudah menceritakan tentang proyeknya di uh, Indonesia. Bagaimana dulu awalnya ia pertama datang ke Indonesia, kemudian yang uh, dua-duanya kebetulan Charles dengan Brian ini bukan sungguh-sungguh fotografer di awalnya, tetapi kemudian dia berpindah dengan fotografi dan kemudian uh, berkecimpung di fotografi hingga sekarang. Jadi awal kedatangannya di Indonesia, uh, Mas Brian ini tertarik dengan uh, komunitas yang ada di uh, Bali sebetulnya ya, dan kebetulan ia juga seorang pemain musik gamelan dan bahkan sampai sekarang sebenarnya dia masih Gitu ya, Mas Brian, ya. Halo, Mbak Rita. Suaranya nggak jelas. Oh, so, sorry. Ya, putus-putus. Maaf. Oke, saya ulang. Uh, ya, Mas Brian dan Su Suaranya agak mendengung, Mbak Rita. Perbaiki dulu mic-nya atau... Oke, okay, oke. Okay, okay. nah, ah. Oke, okay, udah sip. Sudah lumayan, ya? Oke. Okay. Ya, okay, saya sip. ulang lagi mungkin uh, sedikit, ya. Jadi sekali lagi bahwa Brian dan Charles pada awal mulanya bukanlah fotografer, tapi kemudian mereka memutuskan untuk menjadi fotografer karena pengalaman yang mereka lalui dalam perjalanan hidup mereka. Ketika Brian datang ke Bali, kemudian dia juga bersekolah di situ, maka ia menemukan passionnya di fotografi dan kemudian membawa pameran fotonya hasil ini ya pengalamannya yang dia dapatkan di Indonesia untuk dipamerkan di Johnson Museum yang waktu itu katanya mungkin pertama kalinya ada pameran yang diikuti oleh fotografer Indonesia dan itu ada di Cornell University. Kemudian bersama dengan itu ketika pameran tentang uh, identitas Jawa, sorry, uh, fotografi kontemporer di Jawa, Brian juga menerbitkan bukunya yang uh, Identity Crisis. Nah, uh, 
Kemudian Brian juga menceritakan pengalamannya ketika uh, ia menjelajah ya di Jawa, bagaimana ia menemukan bahwa komunitas-komunitas tertentu itu ternyata uh, sebetulnya memang uh, apa ya menarik untuk difoto. Jadi bukan hanya sekedar yang kelihatan eksotis, tetapi juga misalnya ada orang yang uh, berkekurangan dan kemudian dengan culture-nya begitu ya. Uh, kemudian untuk buku keduanya, Brian masih uh, Brian mengatakan masih on progress dan itu nanti akan ada semacam kompilasi dari beberapa penulis uh, fotografer juga. Dan sebetulnya uh, jika Anda perhatikan di participants itu beberapa yang terlibat dalam buku Brian yang kedua itu hadir di bersama kita malam ini. Sepertinya ada Pak Aminuddin ini ya, Pak Aminuddin Seregar, kemudian ada uh, siapa lagi tadi? Brian mungkin bisa menyebutkan penulis yang Anda akan bahwa di buku kedua ada ya di uh, peserta kita malam ini sepertinya ya. Oke, okay, lalu untuk uh, Charles, tadi Charles menceritakan dengan cukup uh, menurut saya emosional ya. Mungkin uh, teman-teman semua juga merasakan bagaimana Charles menceritakan tentang Kamboja dan Khmer Merah. Uh, kalau tadi Charles menyebutkan dengan Khmer Rouge, uh, kita mengenali dengan Khmer Merah. Mungkin uh, beberapa masih membekas juga cerita tentang Pol Pot dan sebagainya, tetapi bagi Charles, sesuatu yang tidak terlihat itu justru hal yang menarik bagi dia. Bagaimana ia kemudian uh, menemukan arti bahwa fotografer ternyata tidak sekedar menjadi fotografer karena ternyata dia harus berke apa ya berkelim dan juga dengan budaya yang ada di situ. Bagaimana ia harus bisa menjalin komunikasi yang baik seperti yang ia ceritakan tentang warga Rama yang di Kamboja itu. Uh, bagaimana Rama dan orang-orang Kamboja saat itu? harus dan terpaksa menyembunyikan fotonya. Makanya di buku Charles yang berjudul Berit, itu berisi tentang foto-foto keluarga yang terpaksa dikubur, disembunyikan untuk menutup identitas mereka dari uh, kemer merah. Dan uh, berjalan dengan seiringnya waktu, kemudian Charles masih uh, membuat proyeknya ini, dia masih um, berkomunikasi dengan Rama, si uh, orang Kamboja itu, dan kemudian ia mencoba menyusun kembali kenangan-kenangan dalam bentuk fotografi yang kemudian ia pamerkan di beberapa tempat termasuk salah satunya yang utama ia membawa kembali foto-foto kenangan itu ke Kamboja dan dari situlah uh, memori yang pernah terputus hilang dan tidak terlihat kemudian bisa dilihat lagi oleh banyak orang bahkan secara umum ya sekarang nah kira-kira uh, ini ya ringkasan dari saya semaja, uh, seperti itu nanti akan disambung oleh Pak Pamungkas mari Pak Pamungkas Ya, uh, terima kasih Tita. Uh, selamat malam semuanya. Uh, selamat malam Mas Brian dan Mr. Charles. Uh, saya sangat senang dengan acara ini. Yang pertama, uh, saya memberikan apresiasi untuk acara ini karena uh, menurut saya konteks yang dibawakan pada malam hari ini cukup menarik dengan finding practice photograph in Asia Tenggara. Uh, dari apa yang disampaikan oleh Mas Brian dan saya menyebut Mas ya, nanti ini akan ditranslitkan oleh Tita. Uh, dari yang saya dengar dari paparan tadi, saya menemukan ada beberapa catatan yang menarik mungkin bagi bagi saya tentunya, di mana dalam perjalanannya Mas Brian dan Mas Charles ini sama-sama melakukan. Ini self-publish melakukan riset uh, visual gitu ya dengan menggunakan bahan foto yang kemudian dari keduanya bisa menghasilkan sesuatu yang yang sebenarnya menarik dan hampir sama. Yang pertama uh, saya menemukan catatan-catatan itu diantaranya adalah bahwa untuk fotografi uh, menjadi sebuah alat komunikasi untuk membicarakan dulu, sekarang dan yang akan datang. Dan ini bisa terlihat dari apa yang disampaikan oleh Mas Brian dan Mas Charles tadi dengan Mas Brian menceritakan tentang uh, kolonial fotografi, kemudian Mas Charles juga menceritakan bagaimana kondisi Kamboja pada zaman itu ketika Brian melihat. Uh, Mas Charles melihat uh, peristiwa-peristiwa yang di Kamboja, dan itu semua masih berlaku sampai sekarang, dan itu juga akan menjadi pemikiran di masa datang. Kemudian kalau saya melihat juga uh, dari yang disampaikan oleh Charles, saya seperti melihat uh, apa yang dibangun oleh Charles ini seperti melihat halnya relief-relief di candi. 
di mana Charles bercerita tentang Kamboja dengan foto-foto yang kemudian dibukukan oleh Charles e, tentang masanya sehingga bisa dibaca untuk di masa yang akan datang di mana persoalan atau topik yang ada e, bukanlah sebuah masa lalu tetapi merupakan perjalanan panjang dari seorang pengusaha yang di sini diwakilkan si Charles ini pada kondisi di Kamboja yang kemudian dalam buku Barry tadi lebih ditekankan pada si Charles bahwa di sana ada tokoh yang bernama Rama yang ditemukannya, yang di dalam ceritanya di, di bukunya Barry ini cukup menarik. Kalau tidak salah, saya melihat referensi yang ada di Charles. Beliau melakukan risetnya ini selama 4 tahun kurang lebih. Ya. Kemudian untuk si Mas Brian, juga eh, cukup menarik apa yang dia sampaikan, apalagi dia bercerita tentang perjalanan fotografi di Indonesia, khususnya di Jawa, dia eh, membaca sebuah foto untuk melakukan identitas. Dari kedua hal yang tadi disampaikan oleh Mas Charles dan Mas Brian, eh, dalam catatan saya, saya bisa mengambil apa sesuatu yang bisa kita tawarkan bersama gitu ya bahwa eh, kedua beliau ini merunut sebuah histori pada masa yang dianggap sama pada masanya tentunya pada masa di mana Mas Brian mulai meneliti tentang foto eh, perjalanan fotografi yang ada di Jawa khususnya kemudian Charles juga mempelajari sejarah yang ada di Kamboja sampai dengan menemukan keluarga Rama Keduanya itu mempunyai kesamaan ketika Mas, Mas Bayan mulai meriset sejak zaman kolonial sampai hari ini di mana ada keterbiasan, kemudian ada proses perjuangan yang di Mas Bayan diwakili dengan proses pencarian identitas, kemudian di Mas Charles di, kemudian diwakili dengan uh, si Rama yang tadi disampaikan bagaimana dia berjuang dan semuanya ini untuk menatap masa depan. Kemudian untuk uh, Mas Arnot. Uh, Mas Pamungkas. Iya. Ya, sebentar stop dulu. Oh, Mungkin ya. uh, Charles sama Brian pengen tahu yang uh, jenengan sampaikan gitu ya. Oh ya, monggo ya, Mbak Tita sampaikan dulu ya. Ya, yeah. uh, so uh, Charles and Brian, Pak uh, Pamungkas say that actually both of your works and your project have a similarity. So it's like uh, entangled actually between uh, Charles' works and Brian's work that both of you focus on one's identity, which is from the past, present, and future, and all together they will bring back the complete memory, and this past will uh, eventually will be very important for the future, how they will reflect themselves, how will how they will see themselves, and how they will value uh, themselves, their culture, and the history. And uh, those uh, projects that you have done in the past are actually part of the history. Uh, Charles with the Cambodia and uh, Brian with the Indonesia. And um, those projects, uh, both, both of you are actually helping those people to find their true self, their true color. And um, even though it already happened in the past, it will still be uh, important for the future events that every recollections of memory will help uh, the, the generations, the new generations to learn their history. So that's why both of you, even though you are a photographer, but you also learn about history, not just the history of photography, but the history of each culture, each horror happened in their lives. So. Uh, That's uh, Pak Pamukas Said, and then Pak Pamukas, monggo bisa diteruskan lagi. Ya, terima kasih Tira. Uh, mungkin ini uh, sedikit sebagai penutup dari catatan yang saya sampaikan bahwa uh, di tangan Brian dan di tangan Charles, uh, fotografi telah menurut saya menjadi sebuah perilaku gitu ya, dan juga menjadi uh, alat yang dulunya mungkin uh, Brian melihat bahwa fotografi itu menjadi alat eksploitasi ketika zaman kolonial uh, sebagai alat propaganda atau untuk menggali apa yang ada di tempat bangsa terjajah. Tetapi kemudian pada zaman berubah, fotografi menjadi alat untuk memerdekakan diri. 
dan membantu kita untuk mencari jati diri bangsa kita sendiri. Kemudian uh, untuk Mas uh, Charles tadi juga disampaikan bahwa hal yang sama bahwa kemudian foto itu menjadi alat untuk memperdekat dirinya dan kemudian untuk membantu untuk kehidupannya di masa depan. Dan di keduanya uh, saya melihat di Mas Arnold bahwa bercerita tentang proses perjalanan fotografi di Jawa itu dengan melalui para seniman dan karya-karya fotografi yang ada. Kemudian dia memilih pada titik fotografi kontemporer sebagai alat penanda identitas dan memerdekakan diri ketika di Indonesia. Kemudian untuk Mas Charles, dia melihat tentang sebuah karya foto dokumenteri yang mungkin tanpa disadari oleh orang yang memilikinya. Ya, kemudian ketika berada di tangan Charles, itu kemudian bisa dikata, sehingga bisa dipakai sebagai alat untuk bercerita tentang masanya. Kemudian membawa wacana dari proses ketertidasan, kemudian ada proses perjuangan yang itu semua dipakai untuk masa depan. Jadi sebenarnya di kedua beliau ini mempunyai hal yang sama. Mungkin itu Mbak Tita. Nanti saya sambung satu pertanyaan yang bisa kita diskusikan. Baik, terima Halo. kasih sekali ya. Pak Pamungkas. Ya. Terima kasih sekali atas uh, tanggapannya untuk presentasi dari uh, Charles dan dari uh, Brian. Jadi uh, intinya sekali lagi, uh, sorry. Uh, so Brian and Charles, so once again, uh, Pak Pamungkas would like to, uh, uh, what is it, to say that actually both of your works uh, help them to see their own identity. And actually, Charles, from your work, you help them see their uh, hidden treasure in photography that you uh, actually do it some uh, Photoshop and sort of things to uh, repro the photographs. And then also for Brian, uh, you help them understand their own identity through the photo that you uh, collect in your books. And um, Brian and Charles, maybe you would like to add something? Um, sure, uh, I'll try going first. I'm um, Afsaya Kulia di Bahasa Inggris. Saya mengerti Bahasa Indonesia. Karena sudah banyak lama saya belum kembali ke Jawa dan saya sudah lupa banyak Bahasa Indonesia. Tapi mungkin saya bisa di Bahasa Kedua dan itu lebih jelas. Um, yeah, um, uh, untuk identity crisis, for identity crisis, um, uh, semua uh, seniman di, di proyeknya, um, I, I think um, each of those photographers um, is uh, looking at a personal or cultural identity and part of um, my going to Indonesia, um, I think was part of the same. <laughs> I felt um, unhappy with so much of what I learned in American culture. Uh, the, and I saya pergi ke Indonesia untuk um, identitas baru untuk saya juga. <laughs> uh, so I go to Indonesia uh, looking for new ways to think about myself. And what I like about the work that I've developed is that it's going both ways. Mudah-mudahan saya bisa bantu seniman di Indonesia dengan idea baru dan sejara baru dan I don't know many things. I hope I hope I'm teaching as much as I'm learning uh, from the people I work with in Indonesia. Okay, yeah. sudah, Brian. Um, I thank you for that summary as well. It's really, it's really nice to hear these perspectives. I, I, I think with um, yes, there's a lot of. I think the collaborative aspect of the work um, has, you know, taught me so much more about um, not just Cambodia but also. Um, about my my thoughts about photography um, and language and and also um, but also to what extent 
this sort of questioning that I have can come, you know, how, how long it can continue. Um, I mean, when we look at, you know, Cambodia, there are, you know, um, remarkable, remarkable photographers dealing with more contemporary issues. And, and, and I think that, you know, there, as this work has evolved, I think my questioning will evolve into something else. And I think that's where, you know, the collaborative side of what Catfish does um, and the books that we hope to publish in the future can bring this more contemporary view. The historical part is very important and it's very nice to hear that it has some significance. Um, and it's then really as a practitioner working in Cambodia from, from the outside, um, how I then ensure that the perspective I have is beneficial for the progression of photography, um, questioning and um, sort of um, the answering of questions that families may have. So, um, and that's, that becomes, that becomes the importance of this development of practice. So yeah, it's um, where it goes in the next five years is going to be really interesting if these questions are still the same, really. Yeah. Saya pikir semua seniman fotografi harus menggati sejarah fotografi. I think it's important for all photographers to understand the history of the medium. Um, and because photography is so important to world culture and um, because photography has been weaponized uh, in contemporary news, Kabak um, and and in colonialism, um, I think it's uh, really important for um, photographers from all over the world to look at new histories, uh, to look at histories from Africa and Southeast Asia and Latin America and um, so much of, <clears throat> excuse me, so much of the, the discourse or history of the medium has been dominated by Europe and America and Japan. Um, and part of what has excited me about MES 56 or a lot of um, Fotografi Contemporary di Indonesia, the Benyak idea, idea baru. I, I think there are ways of thinking about photography that can only be understood um, by photographers who've grown up with a very different history of the medium. And I hope it's helpful for both photographers in Indonesia um, to share my perspective on that history. But I also hope um, the, the book we're doing with After Hours, A History of Photography in Indonesia, uh, um, essays on photography from the colonial era to the digital age. Uh, we are doing it in Bahasa Ingres in English because we want it to reach a global audience. Uh, we want people in Europe and the United States to be reading this book and to be sharing more about what can be learned from the history of photography as a tool of colonialism to learn more about what's going on in contemporary art and contemporary photography in Indonesia. So I hope that is something that keeps going back and forth. Uh, and seniman di Indonesia bisa belajar dari seniman di Amerika dan seniman di Amerika bisa belajar dari seniman di Indonesia. Um, some very innovative photography by MES 56 and, and ETB uh, so I'm really delighted to have the opportunity, I hope, um, to work between those communities to share ideas. There's quite a big question on the side here. Um, shall, I, shall I answer this? I'm working on research in Indonesian family archive and photography in relation to history. My main data is from family archive found images donated from some families. I would like to know the methodology of your project. I'm interested in your approach to the Cambodian family archive. How do you work with the small numbers of photographs and find connections to the wider perspective of history? I, um, if I may answer that, thank you. That's a, a really great question. I think um, th there's a lot of these archives existed and, and I, I was trying to um, comment on this in the talk that found Cambodia um, 
found Cambodia is small in comparison. And the reason it's small is because it takes such a long time to build the relationships and then ensure that all the work is captioned um, by the families um, and then resides in this space. Um, it's, you know, the data's correct, the time the images were taken. And we, we spend a lot of field time doing that. And, and that's, that's an important part of the methodology of it. Um, and I'm quite open to people um, accessing the archive so you can search it and that it's open um, and that anyone can look. I think that's something that Found Cambodia does that's very different to other online archives where you don't have access to them and you can't view the work. Um, and in regards to the family photograph, you know, we, we have to be quite careful with family images because they, they are often a very curated view of the family, you know, I mean, I don't, there's no pictures in my family archive of anyone arguing or anyone being sad or upset. So it is very curated by the family itself. Um, but the things that I was always looking for within the images that I look at from found Cambodia and the way it was curated was that, that we were looking at key moments in history in Cambodia that weren't often pursued um, by the sort of the mainstream media narrative associated with it. So we looked beyond that. Um, and that was for me sort of contesting um, the role that photography is used in, in, in media. So hopefully that answers your question, but I think it's, it's really understanding how the, how the work functions in relation to your question. This, so can, I add, can I add one thing to this before the other questions? Uh, and a film documentaire, uh, Tentang uh, Diane Arbus, then uh, the, the film you too, and the uh, um, Discussi Dengan uh, Lizette Modell, then the uh, Guru Diane Arbus. Yeah. So there's a documentary film about Diane Arbus with an interview with Lizette Modell, who is Diane Arbus's teacher. And in this film, uh, Lizette Modell reflects on a conversation she had with Diane Arbus, where she told her the more specific she can become, the more general it, it becomes, the more universal it becomes. And I think sometimes looking at a, a history as specific as a family history, there's a lot of cultural history in that family. Um, and we have a couple more questions. Um, uh, Charles, Brian? Yeah. Okay, sorry, uh, we haven't come to the question and answer session yet. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Uh, you've been helping me with my work. Um, before we go to the next question, uh, mohon maaf, tunggu sebentar, karena uh, Pak Pamukas akan menambahkan sedikit untuk uh, tanggapan dari Charles dan Brian tadi ya. Uh, apalagi Pak Pamukas ini sebelum jadi dosen fotografi, beliau juga seorang jurnalis di, me di koran ya Pak ya, waktu itu ya. So Charles and Brian, uh, Pak Pamukas, uh, before he uh, worked as a lecturer, he was a photojournalist uh, for quite a long time. So uh, I think he can give a little comment, a bit of comment about uh, uh, your works and also his background as a photojournalist. Monggo Pak Pamukas. Ya, uh, terima kasih, Tita. Ya, sebenarnya uh, pengalaman saya belum 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 lama gitu di dunia jurnalisme uh, saya berada di jurnalisme baru sekitar 8 tahun dari tahun 2000 dari sampai 2008 saya berada di Jawa Pos ketika itu kalau melihat dari karya-karya yang ada dalam uh, risetnya Mas Brian dan Mas Kelas ini sebenarnya kalau saya melihat uh, hampir sama sebenarnya dengan perilaku ya dilakukan oleh teman-teman jurnalis juga bahwa bahwa dalam suatu proses uh, karya yang disampaikan pasti itu ada yang mengandung pesan cuma mungkin cara atau menitipkan pesan dalam sebuah visual itu yang mungkin ada sedikit perbedaan itu karena kemudian ketika di jurnalis itu banyak sekali aturan tata cara sehingga uh, sebuah karya visual itu bisa tampil sementara ketika uh, visual ini kemudian dibuat di riset dan kemudian dikomunikasikan kembali oleh Brian dan Charles ini menjadi sesuatu yang yang lebih panjang pesan yang 
ingin sampaikan. Sebenarnya yang ingin saya sampaikan adalah mungkin bisa dipakai sebagai diskusi pada malam hari ini, Tita. Uh, kira-kira bagaimana sih kemudian uh, cara untuk menitipkan pesan dalam setiap visual yang kemudian dipilih baik oleh Brian maupun Charles. Uh, sehingga kemudian baik buku-buku yang mereka sampaikan itu kemudian pesan itu seperti yang kita harapkan misalnya atau seperti Brian dan Charles harapkan bahwa bahwa ini memantik untuk melakukan sesuatu mungkin itu si Tita oke okay. ya yeah. terima kasih Pak Pamungkas so Charles and Brian uh, there is one question from Pak Pamungkas uh, how will you uh, deliver your message through your visuals in photography And how can you ensure that those messages are delivered to your audience? Okay, who will respond first, Brian or Charles? I can try. Um, In Bahasa? Uh, bahasa yang mana? Uh, <laughs> uh, bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> yeah. um, the practice, uh, saya, um, saya uh, kadang-kadang um, saya pikir tentang audience, uh, tapi um, saya lebih suka berkerja dari, dari passion. <laughs> uh, dan mudah-mudahan uh, dengan itu, uh, idea datang uh, lebih jelas. Uh, ada banyak, banyak heart, banyak passion. Uh, mudah-mudahan um, itu sama untuk audience. Um, So I, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say, it very infrequently do I think of my audience. And I think if the work you're doing comes from your heart, if it comes from passion, um, somehow that is conveyed to the audience. Uh, so I think the most important thing is um, the depth of your connection. Uh, I think if you're doing something only on the surface that doesn't involve um, Uh, the be shakti, yeah. You know? um, the ideas uh, won't really translate. The commitment won't really translate to anybody. So I think it's important that it comes here first. Shakti bertama shakti dulu, yeah. Dan mudah-mudahan dengan shakti, dengan passion, itu sama untuk audience. Terima kasih Brian. Bagaimana dengan anda Charles? What do you think? I, yeah, I think, I mean, originally, you know, from working in more of a photo journalistic, my audience was people that read publications. I, I never really thought of my audience. I, I was thinking more how the work would probably get out. And, you know, and, and I showed that s- screenshot earlier on saying where bomb divers ran, you know, and, and probably at the time I thought, well, it's running there. So it is getting to an audience. But what I started to realize is that, you know, people historically, particularly, you know, media have been, have never been that interested in Cambodia. Um, and, and I agree with Brian a lot in terms of you have to do the, you have to enter these things with the passion and the heart to actually believe that people will have the same passion and heart for the work that you make. You know, you don't, I don't think any photographer really makes work to think where, it will go to here and it will go to there. And the same with the book that we made with the Ramas. We didn't know what it would be until it came about. And then and then audiences appear. More recently though, particularly with Catfish, I do think about whilst, or Catfish or any of the work I'm making myself, that I am becoming increasingly conscious that if this work that is made in a particular location, there should be some sort of dialogue within that community or space. And, but again, how, how that happens really is dictated by the work itself. But I've become a little bit more focused on it manifesting itself in its place where it was originally, originally born and originally made. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, thank you so much, Gerald and Brian. Ya, jadi mau kurang lebih kita harus pakai uh, apa hati ya, pakai passion untuk uh, melakukan semuanya. Dan uh, Pak Pamukas mau ditambahkan lagi nggak? Uh, saya tidak, saya sepakat dengan yang disampaikan bahwa jurnalistik pun juga begitu. 
uh, seperti yang disampaikan di apa, filosofi jurnalistik bahwa seorang fotografer itu mengambil sebuah momen uh, dia sebenarnya menitipkan pesan apa yang dirasakan oleh si fotografer ini kepada karyanya yang harapannya itu juga sama dirasakan juga oleh pembaca foto itu dan itu sama seperti yang disampaikan oleh Brian dan Charles tadi saya sepakat dengan uh, ada satu mungkin yang ya, nanti nanti sebelum audien yang lain uh, menyampaikan pertanyaannya uh, apa namanya estetik experience pengalaman estetik yang yang beliau berdua itu dapatkan ketika kemudian misalnya Brian mengapa memilih titik fotografi kontemporer di Indonesia sementara itu Uh, kalau tidak salah itu berada pada pada satu zaman yang sama gitu di era 90 ribu gitu ya. Sementara juga si Charles juga bisa men, apa, memilih untuk bercerita tentang Kamboja. Ya, tadi di akhir dia sampaikan memilih di keluarga Rama. Sementara uh, saya yakin di Kamboja banyak Rama-Rama yang lain, tapi memilih yang Rama ini. Gitu. Mungkin itu tidak Oke, cukup terima kasih. bisa dijelaskan. Oh, oh. Ya. Yeah. Uh, one more question from Pak Pamukas for uh, Brian and uh, Charles. Yeah. Um, both of you seem to work on your project during the 90s and is it right during the 90s? Uh, no. Um, I started my, <coughs> my project di di tahun um, 2011. Uh, 2011 ya. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Uh, and Charles? My, my work um My work questions probably a lot about the 90s. So it was made in the 2000s, but a lot of the questions are rooted in what happened in, in the early 90s. Okay, so why both of you chose, uh, okay, Charles, why did you choose, uh, why did you choose Cambodia and this specific Rama? Why not the others Rama? And then uh, Brian, why did you choose to uh, work on the contemporary photography which is in Indonesia and not the other places in Southeast Asia, for example. Okay, so uh, who will respond first? Brian? Shall I, sorry. Shall I go first yeah. this time, Brian? Yeah. Um, with um, why Cambodia is a question that I ask myself daily. Um, there was, there, I have no links to Cambodia. There is nothing, there is no relation to the country whatsoever. Um, I was there for work and and stayed and lived there for long periods of time and um, asked myself a lot of questions about what my capacity is in that space. Um, and I started to realize that I'd gone so far that, that there was a growing base of knowledge of language um, that to walk away from it would be a disservice to to the people that I'd engaged with and it um, and I was looking around at photography um, and I think the Cambodian pho photography scene is absolutely fantastic I wasn't that impressed with the Westerner photography scene um, and I sort of made a commitment to continue to work in that space And and I started to think a lot about the you know the sort of parachute journalist and how I or the parachute photographer and how removed I was from that um, and the sort of relations that I built around the work that I made and I think that's when you when you ask the question why the Ramas and, and not another family um, the thing that sort of happened with the Ramas was that when I met when I met Vera, Vera presented this work and there was, I thought there was this joint interest between us that there was something to be done with this. Um, other families have not had bodies of work as complete, but were happy for the work to sit in the archive. And I think, you know, I've worked with some families and, and nothing's happened. And then with the Ramas, this sort of came to a, a, a conclusion. Um, But really, it's not not about what I choose. Um, it's about if a family chooses to work with me. Um, you know, people will engage, and then maybe they don't want to continue. Um, but the Ramas, you know, 
just went in into this process and I sort of developed it around around their wants and needs. And and there's there's an unwritten well, there's a very spoken sort of rule between myself and the family that when they are done, they are done. And we we will the work finishes and we only ever pursue what they want to pursue. And so I, th- I think that's an important part about how I work and, and how I really, you know, continue to engage in that space. So Charles, uh, for example, if you think you at that time you met another family, uh, what kind of a project or what kind of result do you think you will get? Have you ever no idea. <laughs> no idea. I mean, that's that's the great part of it, really. Um, did I ever imagine my... Did the young photojournalist ever imagine that the practice would be where it is? Well, no. And I think it comes back to that finding practice in Southeast Asia that it will... It, practice just has to evolve. And, um, and as I say, you know, we never knew it was a book. Books were never a part of my practice, what I thought was my practice until I worked with the Rama family. And then, you know, we, we entered into this journey together and that at times was very unphotographic, you know. Um, I mean, some of the, the best experiences with the Rama families are not conversations around photography, you know. They're conversations around history or around food or Khmer culture. Um, and so I, I'm a firm believer, and I think it reiterates what Brian said earlier about, I think you were talking about heart or caring or feeling connected to sort of work. And I think practice comes out of that. So um, I, I, the work could be something completely different if I, or it, we, I may never work with another family again. It just, you know, it, work evolves for me. Hopefully, does that answer that question? Yeah, and um, this is a personal question for me because uh, you talk about the family portray the family trees uh, that they bury the, their photographs just to uh, cover their identity. Uh, actually, in Indonesia, there are lots of family who do not have a family photo, uh, not because they bury them, but because they don't have camera. And uh, years to come, they have uh, kids, uh, grandchildren, then they will ask uh, how do my grandparents look like? Uh, what do you think uh, you can do with that kind of thing from the cultural uh, perspective? So sorry, do think, I... uh, documenting the photography. Uh, the, sorry, the do- documenting the family portraits is important, or no? In the in the way that we need to uh, recollect memories from the past and to build. Uh, uh, the, the stories for the family and how we connect from one generation to generation. Have you ever been it's, Yeah? Yeah, well, I, I mean, photography is the area of the medium which I've, you know, have, have happened to work in. Um, but it's really interesting to think about how else we convey. Um, I mean, the photograph, you know, you know, can only do so much and I think that you know we, we do place a lot on it, and um, and often when I look at certain photographs, you know, I mean, photographs do very different things for different people. But I was interested in an interview with the photographer Lin Chan Soklina in Cambodia, um, um, a good friend of mine, and I read a, an interview with him recently where he talked about how memory is passed down through generation to generation through the spoken word or through the written words. Um, and, you know, photography is, the re-emergence of photography in Cambodia really is only the last 20 years. So I think, you know, there are many different ways of recording or remembering family history, um, but it's such a subjective thing. It's, it's difficult to say that one is more significant than the other, but I think in the debate of this context in photography, it's significant to us. What do you yeah. think, Brian? Then can I can I pick up from there? Yeah. Who are you speaking? Uh, me, Alex. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, can I, uh, Charles? Can I pick up from what you just said about the the family photograph and and memory and all those uh, the idea of um, the idea of people archive? Uh, I would like 
to know uh, what the, the Rama families uh, thought when you exhibit uh, your their family photograph. I, I guess I'm asking about the the the, the chains the, the, the chains of the photograph photograph the value of the photograph from the family chronicles become the uh, historical document and then become the uh, object of display. So the there is there is the there is, there is the familial fam value document document value and then the exhibition value. What the what the, the family who own the photograph think about this uh, about those process the, the changing process of the values of their photographs? Yeah, with um, thank you for the question. Um, the um, with the Rama family, it was um, so I've I've actually done a series of events with the Rama family. So we exhibited the work in Phnom Penh, and we exhibited it as it was in in the book. Um, but also uh, the family were very much involved in, in that process, although they couldn't come to Cambodia, they were in, the, in LA. Um, and we'd spoke at length about what, what would happen when we exhibited the work um, and would we do it again? Um, and for the Rama family being in LA, what was important to them that there was a sense of this journey being um, shown in Cambodia. I, I mentioned earlier that you know, when we talked about audience, that there's a sense of where work comes from, that it would return to that space. So Vera has been very hands-on um, in the process. Vera actually came to the UK and spoke at the Photographer's Gallery about the work. Um, and as I, as I said earlier, they're very much involved in all processes of it. But, you know, they were aware that when the images went from their archive to a book, you know, the changing context and the context of that is changed by the essays in which they're in or to the exhibition. Um, and, you know, we're, that's why we've taken a long time to sort of ensure that their involvement is, you know, is the most important thing. You know, we only ever do what they're comfortable with. Say, for example, the work is being published in a book that's coming out about 150 years of Cambodian photography, um, which comes out later this year. Um, and although the family have said to me, you do what you want with the work, I, I don't feel that I still have the authority to do that. Um, I'd actually hope Vera could be here today, um, but unfortunately he's not. So, so the family are very conscious about all stages of it. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, kind of. Uh, so because I guess I want, I want to, 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 to know more because you, you, you told us earlier that it is them who contacted you first. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, so. Do you think that's that's this some kind of urge or some kind of motivations among the Cambodian population to use their personal photograph, their familial record, as part of the larger uh, pictures of the Cambodian history? This, because I I notice I I notice the same thing, similar things happen elsewhere in South and Southeast Asia. For example, the Nepal Picture Library Initiative, yeah. who they collect people photograph and, and build it as part of the national kind of um, archival photograph. And I'm just mm -hmm. wondering whether the same kind of uh, urgency, the same kind of initiative also take place in, in Cambodia. With, in relation to, um, I mean, the Rama family is the first one. Yeah, whether, whether other, other family also- Oh, will, sure, yeah. Or willing well, to, to 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 donate or to yes understand yeah um if i if i could just frame it with the cambodia uh, sorry with the rama family first and that will i can then okay. lead back into that with um i mean it's difficult to ever say there's been very personal conversations with the ramas and um i say it would have been good for them to be here but um to what extent Vera in particular felt a need to share and, and to what end that that act of sharing these images had for the family, um, I think has been quite significant, but mm. that's not because of anything I've done. That's because of their want to talk um, and discuss what happened to them before and after, because the work doesn't just reside in 
Cambodia, it talks very much of the refugee experience, and, and that's something that's very close to Vera's heart, um, having, you know, grown up in, being brought up in the, the American South and then moving to LA. With other families, um, the process has been quite different. Um, I've met with families, or it's been, it initially started with friends, and their interest in sharing work and sharing conversations seemed to be the thing that drove it forward. And, and then, as it always does in Cambodia, it was a process of being referred from one person to another. It's something that we try yeah. to replicate. I suppose, in Cambodia. Ada, eh, makanya ini harus ngalamin ini aja. Oke, okay, uh, Mas Alex, apakah sudah terjawab pertanyaannya tadi? Mas Alex? Oke okay, ya. Yeah, uh, I'm with story. Yes, ya, uh, yeah, sudah terjawab. Terima kasih terjawab, dan saya yeah. juga mau minta Terima maaf tadi. Terima kasih juga Mas langsung. Alex. Terima kasih, ya. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Charles. Um, okay. So, I will read the question for Brian and also for Charles, actually. Uh, this is from Oki Cahyo. Uh, he asked about how does photography role the shifting of new identities in Asia? Um, I think that's a really good question, um, but I think it would be a better question <laughs> to ask Oki. Um, as somebody, I mean, I have, it's been two years since I was last in Indonesia with the pandemic and um, I, I, it's expensive for me to get to Indonesia. Um, but I also think that um, photography and social media in particular um, have done a remarkable job of opening doors for people and opening connections. Um, I was thinking about this uh, during the exchange that Alex and um, Charles were just having. Uh, a month ago, I was contacted by um, a young performance artist in Brooklyn, in New York City, who is of Chinese Indonesian descent, um, who's working on a project that kind of involves some family photographs and things like that. Uh, and I think there is something about um, an exchange of identities and a sort of level playing field that emerges with social media in terms of, I mean, there's no such thing as a level playing field, but there are particular barriers which are easier to, to navigate. Uh, and I'm really interested in seeing how that has continued to change the medium of photography, um, both for myself and for uh, my engagement with Indonesia and uh, how you see photographers um, using that to develop opportunities. Again, I think uh, Mes Nima Inam, Mes 56, is a really great example of that. Um, it started as uh, an exhibition in their dorm room in the late 1990s. And a few years ago, they had an exhibition in the Foam Museum in Amsterdam, one of the most prestigious foam, uh, one of the most prestigious photo museums in the world. Um, and I think some of that is just uh, the opportunities we have for um, disseminating and sharing resources and ideas with, with the internet. Um, I'm contacted frequently by photographers like uh, via social media who work in Indonesia and across Southeast Asia. I have recently, in addition to connecting with Charles, uh, connected with a publisher who works in Yangon in Myanmar and The Hague in Austria, who's doing similar kind of work. Um, so I think the opportunities for uh, sharing resources which I think also helps the growth of our projects and our identities. Um, it's something that's changing rapidly for all of us. Charles? Okay, and Charles, how about you? Yeah, I, it's, um, I mean, when I look at it in terms of the you know, Cambodian context, um, and again, it's, it's difficult to talk about, but, you know, 10 years ago, there, there wasn't the work. You know, there wasn't the opportunities for the work to be there, which was the real limitation of, of the industry. Um, but there are, you know, really interesting collectives forming in Cambodia, like uh, Sasa, um, and and actually their roots of getting work out and actually discussing Cambodia from the perspective of of this, you know, 
first generation after con conflict um and and i think that they they use photography in a really exciting way um they approach things and i think that often comes from you know they may have not had a formal photography education and they just approach it in a way of really exploring the medium and exploring what they want to say and i think that's really exciting there's that personal identity but there's this you know re sort of calibrating to the space using photography um and yeah i think i think that's a really exciting part of cambodian photography and you know there are there are two photographers in Bandung I work with um, over the years and friends with Arum Dai Putri, a young woman um, photographer, and she runs a cooperative gallery, gallery in Bandung. Uh, early on, to help raise money for her work, uh, she did these workshops and these publications called Kami Punya Cheripa, which means we have stories, we have our own stories. And for these workshops, she would specifically work with people who had never thought about using photography and they would just use their phones and each one of them would document something that they do every day, which they would then publish in these little zines that she put together. And um, also in Bandung, the Raz Syndicate uh, early on was doing something similar. And because like everybody who has a phone has a camera, um, the Raz Syndicate was trying to work with people in rural communities outside of Bandung uh, to help them understand how they could use those, those cameras and those devices for better understanding their lives and um, their interactions with people. Uh, so there's just so much about digital media that has completely changed photography. For, I mean, that's such a silly thing to say, such an obvious thing to say. Uh, but I think specifically the economics of photography changed a lot. Uh, and a lot more people have access to it and a lot more people can learn from it and utilize it in their everyday lives. Well, so basically there's a shift of, sh of change for the photography rights and for, uh, what is it, uh, uh, the way they take pictures and how they perceive pictures in photography. And um, uh, Charles and Brian, is there a different paradigm for uh, photography in, let's say, Asia, uh, USA, UK, or any other part of the world? And uh, how do you think this photography is used in the social context based on your experience? Um, there are undoubtedly different paradigms, right? So the, the longest and for, for, the lo for a long time, the only a gallery in Indonesia that exhibited photography was the gallery Photojournalistik Antara, right, with Pak Yudi and Pak Oscar. Um, and in New York City alone, there are probably t there are hundreds of galleries and museums that only do photography. So I think the sort of discourse that happens, um, just like comparing the United States and Indonesia, is incredibly different. Um, yet at the same time, I'm like one of the things that has made it easy for me to kind of continually engage uh, this work, these projects, is it's so exciting how much excitement <laughs> there is in, in Indonesia and in Java for photography. So when I work in Bandung in Jogja, um, there are so many young photographers who are so interested in learning about photography and I think photographic education in Indonesia, probably in Cambodia and across Southeast Asia, is still a relatively new thing. Uh, but I think there's a great appetite for it, um, which is really fun to see. And that's a different paradigm, right? Photography, the first photographic schools in Europe were in, in Germany, like in 1918. The first photographic schools in the United States uh, were in 1960. Uh, in Chicago um, and New York City. Uh, and then the first photographic schools in Java were in 1992, right, at EC Jogja. So EC Jogja was the first school to offer classes on photography. Um, those all offer really different paradigms uh, and really different histories. I'd actually like to pick up on what Brian was saying about education. I mean, it's, you know, working at Trent, you know, we're 
it's a there's been a photography course at Trent you know, for decades and and it's really interesting from working in Cambodia to go to Trent to work in a, a formal setting but then to return to Cambodia and um, and have the opportunity to run workshops and teach um, but more importantly to recognize that you know the some of these more informal structures or emerging structures are really radical and are really exciting. Um, so Sasa comes up again with the teaching that they do there. I've been fortunate enough to actually speak at a couple of their events and run workshops um, or some more collaborative processes which are coming up um, with the UN. And I, I'm, I'm very interested how not only the, the scene develops but also how education develops in in southeast asia um and and i and i think what's been really interesting as well is events like this today um you know because of the situation with covid we we haven't been able to travel um brian you know mentioned that earlier and some of the costs involved in it but also what what the possibilities which have opened up from the lockdown here in the uk we taught everything online and some of the work we've had has been produced has been exceptional and I think it now opens up that these dialogues this this becomes the new normal discussing work in in this sort of space with you know 70 participants and we can start opening those conversations up across Southeast Asia and you know Ankle Photo Festival and others are, are hopefully going to utilize this sort of way of broadening the discussion so um, yeah it's going to be a really interesting space for the evolution of education, I think, in Southeast Asia. Okay, um, thank you so much. Yes, um, talking about education and, um, okay, there is a one question from Mohamed Aprianto. Uh, he is a student of history department in uh, Gajah Mada University. Currently, he is working on Indonesian photography in the 1945 up to 1949. And his questions are, the first one is, um, we can read that in the chat column. To what extent photography products or pictures or visual documents as mnemonic device or commemorize some events? And particularly for Brian, uh, were there any, sorry. Okay, maybe you can respond to the first question first. To what extent photography products uh, uh, to commemorize some events? To Charles and Brian. Charles. Brian, do you want to go first or? Oh, sure. Um, I don't, I, one of my favorite writers on Indonesia uh, is Karen Strassler, uh, who writes specifically about photography in Indonesia. So her first book, uh, Refracted Visions, um, is about photography during um, the Suharta era the Suharta era. And her most recent book, Demanding Images, is kind of addresses this question. And um, specifically um, talks about kind of the photography as both kind of an index of history and um, a performance of history. Um, and I think we've reached this point, um, thinking in the United States of the Trump era, and maybe even watching, I was living in Indonesia during the Jokowi, first, the first Jokowi election. Uh, so much of that is staged as a media performance. Um, so I think it's less today an idea of commemorating things. I mean, I think that's the way we've, we've often thought about it. Um, and more of um, fabricating it. <laughs> and I, I think we can even think of that in um, in earlier histories of photography. So I think Alex asked um, Charles about photo albums. And when you're looking at a family photo album, you're looking at a curated history. You're not looking at the tears and the broken legs and things like that. You're looking at everybody being happy and celebrating the turn of the major turn of events and the family's life together. Um, so I think photography has always done that. I think photography has been mythologized as a sort of document for history, which I do believe it is. 
but it, I, th I think photography inherently also performs history <laughs> as much as it documents it. I think that's a very complicated idea, uh, but I think it's, it's kind of doing both simultaneously. Yeah, and do you think there were any influences from other ethnics probably? Well, undoubtedly. Um, I think the, the impact of um, Chinese photographers in Indonesia is something I know very little about. And um, I have actually delayed the publication of my book of essays because I have found somebody who's writing a chapter on, um, on Chinese Indonesian photo albums actually from the 1930s. Um, I think it's very important. And I think the, the impact and role of Chinese Indonesian, specifically of Chinese Indonesian photographers is poorly understood because of the complex relationship Chinese Indonesians have to the greater culture of Java and of Indonesia. Uh, so that's more difficult uh, for me to speak of than it is to think of the role of the Netherlands. So the Dutch government was, um, photography was invented in France and England, but the Dutch government was actually the first colonial government to hire photographers. Um, in 1940, they hired their first photographers to go to Java and was a year after photography was invented. Um, so I think the imprint of that is pretty important. And I think it's um, twofold. I mean, I think photography was really uh, weaponized as a colonial tool. So the, the Dutch would make photographs um, that they would send back to their communities in, in Europe saying like, look at all the wonderful things we're doing for Indonesia. And they were suppressing the photographs of the wars in Aceh and Lombok and things like that because they didn't want the people in Europe to see the violence. And then as photography became easier to, to manage, like as you had more people photographing with roll film and digital cameras and whatnot, um, there started to be new voices, right? So uh, one of the essays that I contributed uh, to this history book um, is about uh, photographers in Europe uh, about the time of the revolution against the Dutch who came over and started to advocate for the revolution, who started to try and encourage um, the Europeans to rethink colonialism and starting to advocate for an independent Indonesia most photographers include Henri Cartier-Bresson and Cass Horthus, like really important European and Dutch photographers. Um, so I think that is still ongoing. If you look at many of the problems we have in the United States, I don't know if you know how much rioting is going on in the United States. I think the impacts of colonialism and racism and slavery are, I don't think we understand them yet. And I think they're really deep and complicated and I understand photography has a really essential role in how we understand that or how we have come to understand that. Um, and I, I don't know if that really answers the question. Maybe it just poses more questions, but. Um, yeah, um, I hope uh, your uh, answer already uh, explained what uh, Muhammad Aprianto wants. Semoga sudah terjawab ya, Mas Muhammad Aprianto. And uh, there is another interesting question from, um, Dita, uh, sorry, from Dianti Andayani. Uh, she asked about, uh, especially for Brian, it was very interesting to see your journey photographing Indonesia and brought it back to the US for Asian or Indonesian photographers or artists to get recognized, published and doing exhibition in the US is not easy. Uh, what would you suggest for us, the Indonesian photographers to break the barrier, especially in today's situation? And hopefully actually IFIS could help us with this too. Okay, uh, Brian. Uh, well, first, it's very hard for American photographers to get recognized and published in America. Um, but it's very competitive. The art world and the photographic world in the United States is very, very competitive. Um, and um, kind of going back to an earlier question, like about audience and, and whatnot, uh, I used to teach photography much more than I do now. Um, and I have really been a, in a position where I can focus on my own work uh, for the last several years. Um, but when I was teaching, I would discourage students from thinking about developing their careers that way. 
and encourage them to, um, to work with as much passion and dedication as they can. Um, but I also think it's important that we connect with other people in the field, um, whether it's me finding Charles in England or me finding Wimo and Balabayang in, in Jogja. Um, I think we do those things because we share interests and building friendships over shared interests, uh, I think has a tendency to make it easier to build opportunities rather than to just kind of seek people out because you want the opportunities that they have. Um, so I'm contacted by people in Indonesia a lot about photography. Um, and I like it when people contact me because they have ideas they want to share with me and it makes it easier for me to help them. I don't like it when people contact me because they want me to help them with their careers, if that makes sense. If they're interested in contacting me because they share ideas and are interested in conversations and photographs, that seems much more constructive. Um, there is one photographer whom I see in our participant list, Anton Guantama, Gutama, uh, who's based in uh, Surabaya. Who's had, he has a, an exhibition coming up in the United States soon at the Griffin Museum. And uh, Anton has been very fortunate to um, participate in a lot of festivals in the United States, which I think makes it a lot easier for him to connect uh, with other photographers and find those opportunities. Uh, I personally have a love-hate relationship with social media. I kind of hate that we use it and I'll try to bring attention to ourselves. Um, but I also love the opportunities and the people that I've met that way. I have made lifelong friends through social media uh, who are in different countries. Two years ago, I, I taught photography for two months in Serbia because somebody found me on social media and I've had exhibitions in, in Russia because people found me on social media. Um, so I, I, I guess the thing that I would say is sincerity is the most important thing and valuing friendships and relationships is a better way to build a career rather than just building a career for career's sake. I hope yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I agree with your Brian. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I think collaborating, sharing ideas is much better and helping with the career itself. Yeah, I think Charles will also agree on it. Uh, by the way, we still have several questions. Uh, I will just go on with the next question. Um, there is a question from Lucky Menjepret or Lucky Menjepret. Uh, Mas Brian and Mas Charles, what, do you, what kind of topic do you think is interesting to be developed uh, in Indonesia or South, Southeast Asia? And do you think you have a, uh, what is it like a, a vision? What will be the key historical moment in Indonesia or in Southeast Asia? For example, like the uh, Hong Kong umbrella protest and uh, sort of things. So maybe uh, Charles, you can respond to that question. Thank you. Oh, yeah, um, that's um, that's a huge question. Um, I I can tell you. I mean, I can tell you the things that that resonate with me, the work that I see and the, the things that um, when I'm looking at work and that's, you know, no authority to say what is good and what is not, but, you know, the work that really interests me that comes out of Southeast Asia is the work that is very um, close to home and, and quite reflective. I mean, I think, you know, what, what seems to be missed often about Southeast Asia is that, you know, particularly in photography, um, and I don't know why it's always missed, is that, you know, it is a huge population of rich and diverse language, history, culture, um, that's being explored in really interesting and radical ways, as we talked about earlier. So, you know, when, again, when, when I refer it back to, Cambodia, um, the work that I see coming out of Cambodia now by photographers is really looking at how the country develops and moves forward and how it balances that with its culture. And, um, and while I'm sat in the background working on this historical work, you see this progression of, um, of how the country develops. And I find that um, 
I find that to be the most interesting work. I think I find the work the most interesting is the work that I can't tell, you know, the, the things that, that I'm not able to do because there are limitations of being, you know, in certain space. Um, so it's finding those things that where you have the intimacy and the access, which is, um, and as Brian talked about, those things that are close to you. That's that's what excites me anyway. Maybe it doesn't ask, answer your question. But. Well, I, I, I have two answers to this question. Uh, one is like history goes by us uh, in the 21st century very, very quickly, right? So like the first things I think of to that question are COVID-19 or uh, Reformacy or um, things like that, that I think are really important to Indonesian culture or the, the conflicts that are going on in Papua right now or um, the tsunami in Aceh, like all of these things are of tremendous significance. Um, I have a friend in Bandung, uh, Jez O'Hare, uh, who spent about 30 years photographing Indonesia from the air and has so much to say about uh, the environment and the landscape of Indonesia and how much is being destroyed. Like he has pictures he can't publish, the Indonesian government or the businesses he photographed them for won't let him publish them because they show things about palm oil production or whatnot that people don't want disseminated internationally or to the public. Um, so I think there's history all around us all of the time. But uh, there were two photographers I studied with in graduate school, one of them right here, um, Laura McPhee is right behind me, uh, who's a woman who spent about 20 years um, going around the world photographing volcanic landscapes. And uh, Laura taught me that photography should be an excuse to get out of your house, that photography is an excuse to wander the world and see what it can teach you. Um, and another one of the photographers is named Abelardo Morel. Um, and my favorite work of his was done in the 1990s when he spent about 10 or 15 years photographing without ever leaving his home. And Abe taught me that you can see the entire world on your kitchen table <laughs> if you let yourself do it. Um, and I think those are two very different answers that I've tried to embody in my own photographs. So I try to get out, go to Indonesia and Serbia and any opportunity I can to travel. Um, but I also, when I photograph, like I'm not looking for um, places of extreme consequence, like palm oil production or something like that. Uh, I'm photographing the landscape and the world that unfolds in front of me, uh, trying to find ways to to see it as being significant and meaningful and my interaction with it as being significant and meaningful. Well, okay, uh, thank you, Charles and Brian. And uh, one last question is uh, from us, Alex, and uh, this is for Brian. So Brian, I'm going to read this in Bahasa Indonesia. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah, Brian, dari dua buku Anda yang judulnya Identity Crisis, dan yang yeah. uh, history of Japanese apa fotografi yang baru ini ya yang akan dimunculkan yeah. bagaimana anda menempatkan fotografi uh, praktek fotografi itu di Jawa khususnya dalam mm -hmm. konteks sejarah fotografi di Indonesia mm -hmm. silakan Mas Brian um, bertama uh, saya berdiskusi identity crisis ya dan um, Idea itu datang dari uh, sejarah baru, sejarah fotografi di Indonesia baru. So the idea for that was looking at new histories. Um, and at that time, um, photography, photographic education, sekolah fotografi dan seni fotografi masih baru di Indonesia. Dan um, semua fotografi di eksibisi dan i, buku itu uh, datang dari um, a transisi, <laughs> a, a transition from, um, from an old way of thinking about photographs to a new way of thinking about photographs. Um, and from old ways of thinking about culture and new ways of thinking about culture that I think are really well represented in the MES 56, MES Mima Inam photographs. Um, so that title um, kind of refers to, and it also 
uh, goes back um, in the front of the book, Ada, Ada idea Ole Astri Wright. So Astri Wright, Siorang, um, Sejata Seni Indonesia, Yang Malu, Dia Menulis Buku, Tentang Lukisan dari Jawa, Mungkin Dua Pelu, Tang Yang Malu. And at the front of my book, there's a passage, um, uh, Dia Menulis mm -hmm. Idea, uh, Tentang Identity, um, uh, Di Indonesia, um, Di Era Suharta, yeah. So um, when I put that project together, I tried to use some of the ideas I learned from Astri Wright and Claire Holt about identities they saw in transition from the revolution into Suharta in the modern era and apply that to Reformasi, the post-Reformasi era and um, uh, the development of photography and photographic education in Indonesia. Um, this new book I'm working on, um, I know like uh, Wu Ben wrote a great book uh, a few years ago, uh, History of Photography in Southeast Asia. And Karen Strassler has written some great books about photography. And there are great books about Cassian Chepas and um, Woodbury and Page and other colonial era photographers. Uh, but I think there's really nothing yet, or at least that I've seen, that puts all of those pieces together. So what interests me about putting this new book together is just taking little pieces of different histories and trying to put them all together in hopes that we can understand a bigger history about the photography and the medium. Mudah mudahan itu jelas dan maaf di bahasa kedua, yeah. Yeah, terima kasih sekali, Brian, untuk tanggapannya. Um, so before we do the closing, uh, Charles and Brian, would you like to add a closing statement for our webinar tonight? Brian, okay. did you want to yes. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> go first? Yes. Um, so I'm uh, Berterma Kasi Lagi. So I'm Sila Lu Suka Koneksi Di Dengan Isi Jogja Dan Saya Bahagia Ibu Tita bisa membantu hari ini, uh, Pak Irwandi. Saya bahagia uh, uh, Mas Alex di sini. Uh, saya berkenal Mas Alex mungkin uh, Inan Town yang lalu di Australia. Yeah. Um, so mudah-mudahan lebih koneksi bisa datang dari, dari uh, Zumanar ini. Yeah. So I, I hope, um, I always love the opportunity to connect with EC Jogja and friends in Java. Um, and I always welcome more connections. Um, um, Irwandi uh, has my uh, email address and my phone number. You can always contact me, anybody who's part of this. If your questions didn't get answered, uh, you can find me on social media. And um, Tita uh, Ada, uh, kita bertanya, um, kenapa Indonesia, ya? Uh, kenapa Cambodia? Dan saya belum, um, saya belum answer question. Um, so, saya, pertama kali saya pergi ke Indonesia, kira kira tiga puluh tahun yang lalu. I first went to Indonesia about 30 years ago. Um, dan saya belum pintar di bahasa Indonesia, dan saya belum mengerti budaya Indonesia. Tapi saya suka coba. Uh, so I'm not, my Indonesian's okay. I can speak Indonesian a little bit. And there's a lot more about Indonesia that I don't know than I do. Um, but it's important to me to keep trying. And uh, Kerina Itu, um, Indonesia hampi sama hulang lain saya. Indonesia almost feels like a second home to me. Um, and uh, I'm always grateful for the opportunity to connect with the universities and my friends uh, in Java. Terima kasih banyak. Sama-sama, Brian. Semoga bisa ke Indonesia segera, dan saya tunggu bukunya ya. <laughs> yeah. Semoga bukunya sukses, Mas. Ya, Mas, ya, mas Brian. Ya, buku all print-nya, print Mas Brian. <laughs> yeah. Silakan, yeah. Charles. Your closing statement. Uh, 
uh, again, my, my awful pronunciation, but Terrarama Kasse, is that correct? Terrarama Kasse. Kasse, thank you, Brian. He has been coaching me for a couple of days. Um, I, I just want to say thank you for, for inviting me to this today. It's um, to connect from, particularly during the lockdown that we have here in the UK, um, which is coming to an end, we are told, um, to be able to reach out to a part of the world which is so dear to me. Um, I mean, it's 15 years in Southeast Asia, mainly in Cambodia, but I think what this opportunity is, and I think it mirrors some of what Brian says, that you know, we are open to forge these links between space and particularly you know, coming from an institution, teaching photography to, to uh, get to speak at such a such an institution as yours and, and the excellence that comes from that is a real honor for me and I'm, I'm very grateful for your for you for that opportunity and, and long may these conversations and links continue um and i've had some messages come through um saying you know to share work and stay in contact and please I, i'd really appreciate that um i think it's been really interesting to to talk about this idea of practice developing in southeast asia and um, um, and hopefully, I, Brian and I have given you an insight into our practices, and, and I've certainly learned a lot. I've actually connected with a few people already through social media, thanks to this. So thank you. <laughs> and uh, things move very fast online. So so thank you, and um, I would I would love the opportunity again in the future. Thank you so much for your time. Well, um, okay, thank you so much, Brian Arnold and uh, Charles Fox for your valuable time you spent uh, with us uh, today. Thank you for sharing your most insightful uh, experience and perspectives on photography. Um, so no, no, no. my uh, conclusion from the presentation today is that uh, photography actually is not about the technique. It's about how you feel about it, how you look the unseen, and then how you bring it to uh, sorry, your everyday life, how to create memories and how to connect uh, one another, something like that. And then um, I would like also to thank you to uh, Faisal Adib once again for organizing this uh, webinar. Thank you for IFIS for having a Brian and Charles Fox today with us. And thank you for all the remarkable participants that have joined uh, this webinar for uh, since 7 p.m. in Indonesia time. And then um, thank you Pak Dekan, Pak Irwandi, terima kasih. Jadi uh, webinar hari ini bisa membuka ini ya, mata kita memberikan pengalaman baru bagaimana fotografi tidak hanya sekedar teknik, tetapi juga bagaimana kita membawa fotografi dengan pesannya untuk uh, ke arah perilaku Bagaimana itu bisa mengoneksikan memori yang satu dengan yang lain, menjalin komunikasi, menyampaikan pesan, tidak hanya bagaimana kita melihat, tetapi bagaimana kita juga bisa merasakannya. Untuk closing, saya punya uh, satu quote dari Juan Miro. Sebetulnya dia seorang pelukis, tetapi sama-sama visual ya. Saya akan bacakan, You can look at a picture for a week and never think of it again. Seminggu dilihat, tapi kemudian nggak dibutuhkan lagi. But you can also look at a picture for a second and think of it all your life. This is what I got tonight. I take a look at your picture just for a second, but then I think it's the whole life. So thank yeah. you so much, Brian and Charles. Terima kasih semuanya untuk malam ini. Mohon maaf jika banyak kekurangan dalam uh, membawakan acara malam ini. Kami segenap panitia mengucapkan terima kasih. Thank you so much. Uh, kemudian untuk Google formnya untuk uh, sertifikat silahkan dilihat di kolom chat silahkan diisi semoga uh, belum hilang ya biasanya ada waktu sekitar 15 menit ke depan untuk mengisi uh, form formulirnya nanti oh sorry form sertifikatnya baik Pak Irwandi ada yang mau ditambahkan sebelum kita benar-benar tutup dan foto bersama eh, terima kasih semuanya yang telah hadir Pak Faisal Mas Brian dan Mas Charles Uh, mohon maaf kalau ada kekurangan dalam acara ini dan mudah-mudahan ini bukan yang pertama dan terakhir tapi kita bisa uh, melanjutkan program ini karena sangat menarik dan sebelum saya tutup saya ini penasaran dengan suaranya Mas Faisal jadi mungkin sepatah dua patah kata dulu Mas Faisal <laughs> monggo 
ditonton ya, Mas ya, Faisal. Pak Irwandi, Pak Irwandi, terima kasih sekali. Uh, ini kerja sama IFS yang kedua dengan FSMR, tetapi yang pertama dengan fotografi. Uh, seperti komunikasi kita sebelumnya, insya Allah uh, kita ke depan yang paling dekat dengan Vivan. Kemudian kami akan melihat peluang fotografi ke fotografi lain dari Amerika karena <tuh> uh, selain Brian, Brivan juga ada beberapa fotografi yang sebenarnya sudah datang ke Indonesia. Nanti kami akan coba kontak mereka dan semoga ke depan kita bisa lebih banyak lagi uh, melaksanakan kerjasama uh, event-event seperti webinar seperti ini. Terima kasih kepada Pak Irwandi, Pak Pamungkas, Bu Atia, dan juga Brian and Carlos. Ya. Amin, amin, amin. Baik, terima, terima kasih Pak sekali Pak. semuanya. Kalau begitu, uh, so this is it, the end of yeah. our webinar. Once again, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, have a nice day for everyone. Selamat malam buat yang di Indonesia di, dan di Asia. But before that, we are going to take a virtual uh, photo shoot. Okay. So, um, host, Mas Aji, Mas Novon, silahkan. Oke. Okay. Um, yes, silahkan dibuka. Boleh dengan, uh, ya, uh, sebentar. Oke, okay, satu, dua, tiga, one, two, three, oke. Okay. Oke, okay, sudah Mas Novan? Yes. Oke, okay. so once again thank you so much, selamat malam, sampai ketemu lagi, terima kasih. Selamat malam, terima kasih. Sukses Mas Pian, Mas Tales. Thank you semua. Thank you. Terima kasih. Charles, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. It was a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Uh, terima kasih, Mas Brian. Ya, matur nuwun, Mas Brian. I, I'm going to have to go because I've got to jump into another meeting. If that's all right, but again, thank you for your time. It's been a real, a real honor. Thank you. Yeah, terima kasih, Brian. Thank you. Bye. Atur nuwun semua, thank you Mbak Tita, pamit undur ya. Mas Pamungkas. Mas Deni, thank you. Mas Deni sudah datang. Thank you Pak Dikan. Oke. Saya kok baru muncul gambarnya ketinggalan. Sudah sudah pakai begini-begini saya. Pak Pamungkas, terima kasih ya. Sama-sama, uh, jangan lupa dipencet ya. Apanya? Bulatnya. Oh iya. <laughs> Oke, okay, kita leave and meeting. Oke, okay, terima kasih Mas Novan. Okay, thank you, Mas Novan, Mas Aji, sukses. Thank you everyone. Bye. Selamat Bye. malam. Selamat malam. Pamit ya. Bye.